Laboratory Values for the Adult Introduction to Nursing Concepts. This is Martha Olson. Why we want to learn lab values is important for all of healthcare because we can identify important things going on with our patients based on their lab values. We make diagnosis, correct underlying problems, and we also can see did the treatment that we gave help or improve the lab value and situation. Knowing abnormals is going to be important for taking care of patients safely. You'll need to know them for NCLEX. And then our nursing actions will change depending on what the lab values are because we have to oftentimes prioritize based on what the lab results show. You have to memorize them and I would uh, recommend that you get 3 by 5 note cards and use them to refer to and flip to as you're doing patient scenarios, as you're doing case studies, thinking about what lab value would I want to know to help me put all the pieces of this puzzle together for the patient. We have to know what they mean and why they might be abnormal in that person and then challenge yourself on a regular basis to keep thinking about lab value. So we'll start with one of our first units called oxygenation and we look at our red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit and then also the BNP is going to be important for <coughs> this unit. Your patient with congestive heart failure or CHF just means that their heart has been damaged for some reason. A lot of times it's with the elderly or after an MI or myocardial infarction. The damage to that myocardial tissue then has caused the heart to not pump as well and it can't keep up with the needs of the body. <clears throat> the typical patient comes into the ER very short of breath or dysmic. They have dyspnea on exertion, meaning when they try to walk or ambulate or move in any way, they just get very short of breath because there's a lot of fluid in their lungs. If the heart isn't pumping good from the left side, it backs up into the lungs and it, it causes them to have fluid buildup. They breathe very fast trying to compensate, and when you use your stethoscope and listen to the lung sounds, they sound very much like they have fluid in there or rails and ronchi. If you look at their extremities, they probably have some puffiness or pitting edema. This is because of fluid overload. They're not able to eliminate it. So the doctor comes in and says, check their BNP. And you find out that it's 400, and you know that a normal is 100 or less. And so you know that because the BNP is elevated, they have congestive heart failure, and they will probably be admitted. You will want to put oxygen on them. We usually give them a medication to help get rid of extra fluid in the body so that heart doesn't have to work as much. And then as a nurse, you'll want to check the weight of that patient so we can look to see, did we take some fluid off? Did they have some weight loss yesterday, from yesterday? The BNP, when you look it up in the Paganda lab book, it talks about the fact that as you have more fluid in that aortic arch, it stretches and it releases hormones that um, tell us how much fluid is really in there causing problems. Another example of a lab value for the oxygenation unit is your surgical patient that had blood loss and we see that with blood loss they have a lower hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood cell count. Your patient is usually pale because they don't have the nice red blood cells giving them color. They're tired because the red blood cells carry oxygen out to all the tissues and so they're not getting enough oxygen to where they need it. <clears throat> and they're short of breath or dysmic because um, the body can't keep up with the needs that you have right now because of lack of oxygen. They might be dizzy or we call that orthostatic hypotension and the heart goes faster or has tachycardia trying to compensate to get more blood going out to the tissues to keep the body going because there's not as much blood to pump around the blood pressure is going to be lower. So the doctor says give them two units of packed red blood cells and check the labs again in the morning. And we will be doing the blood transfusions in the IV unit and doing some scenarios with that. After the blood is given you notice that your patient looks a lot more pink their oxygen saturation has improved up to 92 percent and even though that's considered within normal range you still leave the oxygen on at two liters because they're not optimal and they're still you know lacking the enough red blood cells to carry as much oxygen so give them as much oxygen as we can on two liters of nasal cannula and then your patient isn't quite as dizzy but again I would still definitely use a gait belt and assist them if they're up in case they would get dizzy again 
in the morning the lab work is drawn and it shows that their hemoglobin, hematocrit, and uh, red blood cells have improved and the patient is definitely feeling a lot better today. In our unit for infection control, we'll be looking at the white blood cells and a normal is 5 to 10,000. Leuco means white in medical terminology, so when you have leukocytes, it's your white blood cells that help fight infection. A differential tells about the different components or subunits of your white blood cell count, <clears throat> and they all have different actions, and when we look at those lab values, they tell us what's going on. The neutrophils are the cells that are in the greatest amount, <clears throat> and they also come to the scene of the action when there is an infection, and so when the neutrophils are above 70 percent we know it's a new type of bacterial infection going on in the body. When the lymphocytes are elevated we know that it's probably more of a chronic infection not a new one but something that's been going on in the body for a while and then our good old monocytes come in and help fight the bacterial infection but our neutrophils get to the scene of the action first and they work really hard to take care of the problem but they get tired fast and they die off and go away and go home to rest. The monocytes are a little slower at getting there but they kind of hang on longer. They have a longer uh, life expectancy and they fight that infection until it has been conquered. Eosinophils and basophils are what we call mast cells and they are involved with some of our allergic reactions. So if I see the eosinophil level above 4%, it might indicate that this person is having some problems with allergies and we would need to then kind of focus our treatment and our further testing on what is going on as far as their allergies. The eosinophils and basophils do not really respond to any of our viral or bacterial infections. They just kind of hang out there waiting for allergy season. So when you have leukocytosis, it means an increase in the white blood cell count. And it can be a lot of things going on in the body. It can be viral or bacterial infection. It can be tissue necrosis, and that would be like if I'm having a heart attack and my myocardium, the myocardial tissue, is not getting enough oxygen. You can have people that have an increased white blood cell count because they're having a heart attack. Um, so it could be from trauma, stress. Lots of things can make a white blood cell go up. Your patient is seen in the ER with right-sided pain and you check a white blood cell count and see the neutrophils are getting higher and so you know there's an infection and it's getting worse and it's probably a newer and it's a bacterial infection. And then the doctor does some more tests and diagnoses it as an appendicitis. ITIS on the end of that word, word tells you it's an infection and he uh, says let's take him back and do an appendectomy and when you see the word tomy or ectomy it means to remove which is the suffix or end of the word. Another type of patient that would have important lab values for the nurse to know would be your patient that has cancer. They're on chemotherapy and the chemotherapy then decreases a person's white blood cell count because it's trying to kill off the cancer cells and sometimes gets the good white blood cells as a result. Many of your chemotherapy patients then will come in with a white blood cell count of 2,000 or less. And they are very high risk for infection because they don't have any white cells that are going to fight off that infection. So we put them on what we call a neutropenic precaution, meaning they wear a mask if they go out of the room at all because they don't want to get an infection from somebody else. Your staff will be gowned, gloved, and you know protected when they come into the room so they aren't bringing any infections in. And then we have a sign on the door that has very specific instructions about visiting. The other thing under neutropenic precautions that we often think about is no fresh fruit comes into that room because there could be little bugs on it and there's no fresh flowers that are brought into that room. So we take very uh, important precautions to keep that person from getting an infection because they don't have a white blood cell to help fight it off. In our hygiene unit we'll be looking at some of our coagulation or our bleeding studies because when we do hygiene we might notice or cause problems with bleeding as a result of that. The lab values that go with this are your prothrombin, time or PT, INR or, or international normalization ratio, your PTT or uh, partial thromboplastin, 
and then our platelets go with this unit as well. When we look at the PT or pro time, it's about 11 to 12.5 seconds that it takes to make a clot and it's considered your extrinsic system looking at several of the factors from the liver that are you know made to help make a blood clot. So anybody with problems with their liver might have problems with blood clotting like your alcoholic that has cirrhosis they oftentimes will have um, a lot of problems with making a blood clot because of the damage from the liver. The medication that we give people to make them bleed longer, take longer uh, with bleeding is called Coumadin. And it's for patients that have maybe had a stroke or have atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of different uh, disorders that we give a medication called Coumadin. It's um, used very often, but we check our PT and INR levels to make sure that they are what we call therapeutic or in a range we want. If you're on Coumadin, your PT time is going to be longer than 12.5 seconds because we want you to take longer to make a clot because you have a risk uh, for problems because of clotting. International normalization ratio is just results that are independent of any methods used and so it's kind of a second way of checking uh, to know is that blood clotting in an appropriate time frame that we want. So usually your PT and INR kind of go together so we can see what's going on with that patient. Your PTT goes with a medication that we give IV or IM called heparin. And a PTT or partial thromboplastin time is again in seconds and the normal is 60 to 70 seconds and if I'm on heparin my clotting time or my PTT is going to be longer than 70 seconds. It's used to assess our intrinsic system, again looking at clotting factors that are made in the liver. So your PT and PTT work on a little bit different systems in the body for how blood clots are made. And we know that some of our patients that have conditions like hemophilia uh, will have prolonged uh, PTT uh, lab times. The last one in this clotting unit then is our platelets or our thrombocytes and we know that normal platelets are 150 to 400,000 and these are uh, needed for blood clotting and if a person's platelets are low it's a condition called thrombocytopenia and if the platelets are really high they would be at risk for having clots and strokes and that condition is uh, thrombocytosis. So just a couple of examples of where you might see these important, especially in the hygiene unit uh, or any other unit really, would be uh, watching for bleeding. If your patient is on Coumadin, then if we were going to get them ready in the morning, we would not let them use a straight blade because they could bleed very easily if they would nick themselves. When we look at some of our other factors going on, uh, your patient with a blood clot or a deep vein thrombosis might be on IV heparin. And you can see the label here, it's mixed 25,000 units per 250 milliliters given IV drip. And when we look at that, most of our bags come pre-mixed, but some of them don't and you have to be very good with math to look at that label and know how to mix that so that your patient doesn't get too much because getting the right amount to get that level therapeutic is going to be important. We have what we call a nomogram and it's a set order that when your blood level comes back you look at where it comes and then it tells you what to do with your heparin dose and you don't need to worry about that for this class but just if you hear the word nomogram know that it's kind of my recipe for what the doctor wants me to do with that heparin dose that is hung on that patient with a deep vein thrombosis. And lastly, I'm running out of time, is looking at our hydration unit and our electrolytes and how they're very important. They're often called lights and we know that our sodium is an, um, one that is best friends with our fluids, our water, and sodium and water go together. So if I eat a lot of chips with sodium, I'm going to retain fluid and probably have a lot more edema. Our potassium, 
3.5 to 5 milliequivalents has a lot to do with our heart regularity. It has a big impact on kidney function. If your kidneys aren't working because uh, excretion is solely through the kidneys and